Hello everyone. Uh, well, my name is Mariano Salazar. I come from Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and um, be, I'm the project coordinator of this one, uh, Masculinities and Violence Against Women Among Young People, uh, Identifying Discourses and Developing Strategies for Change Using a Mixed Method Approach. So this was a collaboration between four universities, Karolinska Institute, uh, Alicante University in Spain, um, University College Cork in Ireland, and Ben Gurion University in Israel. This is a picture of our first meeting. As you can see, it's a very diverse range of researchers, both in terms of sex, gender identity, but also age. So we had the opportunity to work with PhD students and also senior researchers and uh, associate professors and so on. And uh, the persons who were leading these uh, activities in the in the countries, well, my, Mariano Salazar here in in, in Sweden, uh, Claire in Ireland, uh, Carmen in Spain, and Nihaya, who is joining us today uh, in Israel. So why why do we do this? I mean, why, why do we focus on positive masculinities? Um, we already know everybody here know that. My traditional masculinity norms are, are linked to more violence against women. Men who support and enact these norms, they are more likely to be violent. Um, but we also know that there is a wide range of masculinities uh, across different settings. Is that, and we have identified through our previous research that there are ways of expressing manhood that are anti-violence and of men that call themselves feminist men that support uh, women's struggle for equity and also reject uh, all the forms of violence against women. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we were discussing of what we were going to do with, uh, with this project is that in the EU there are several studies that have studied masculinities and the different forms and its association with different health issues both with men and with women as well. But there wasn't really anything, any studies, or very few studies that were focusing on the positive part. So are there any discourses uh, specifically describing anti-violence masculinities among, among these, these four countries? But also the question is how can we promote and support this way of thinking? And we decided to focus on on young men uh, and young men and young women because they are the future. But also, we realize that violence against women can start very early hmm? during during um, adolescence, for example. And if this is normalized and tolerated, it can become a pattern later in life. So our aims are not that many as our previous uh, colleague were showing us, but then we focus on four things. One, we wanted to explore and position the discourses that young people, men and women, uh, use in Sweden, Spain, and Ireland in their understandings of masculinities. We wanted to know how these constructions of masculinities influence young people's attitudes, behaviors, and more, most importantly, responses to different forms of violence, physical, sexual, emotional, controlling behavior, and so on. We also wanted to explore what were the individual and societal factors supporting and promoting anti-violence masculinity discourses across different settings. Hmm? And we also wanted to be pragmatic and to some extent develop strategies and resources to support, uh, uh, to support and promote anti-violence masculinities across this setting as well. So what did we do? What we did is that we conducted a mixed method study um, where we started with qualitative research. Um, as you can see, in the first stage in 2019 and 2020, we conducted around 165 interviews with young people, both men and women, and also stakeholders across the different countries. Um, and then uh, these interviews were quite complex. We were discussing many of the issues that I was describing before, but 
at the end of the interview, we asked two questions. We asked the young people and the informants in general, what do you think are the strategies that we can use to promote and support? To promote first, and then later on to support men who express anti-violence masculinities. And then we use the answer to those questions to go to the next stage, which is concept mapping, which is a technique that allows us to quantify the qualitative results. Um, and this, is, this goes in three stages. So once we have identified all the statements, we spend quite a lot of time cleaning them and summarizing from 200 statements to 50 statements. That made more sense. So what we did is that we created a, an online survey that we share with our, with our previous participants, but we also open to other participants as well. And the, the process goes to uh, three stages. First is sorting, where we ask the people, hey, of these 50 statements, put them together in whichever way you want. The second stage is like each of these statements, please rate them in terms of importance, how important do you think they are in relationship to the others, and in terms of feasibility. And as you can see, at the end we got around 400 or so was a sample for this concept mapping study. So in a nutshell, what, what were the main findings here? We, we found from the qualitative studies that in general, of course with, with variations across countries, but in general that young people identify different forms of violence against women and they identify the link between traditional forms of masculinities and violence. They, in general, they reject the most common and extreme forms of violence, but then they recognize and reject that but also more subtle forms of violence when we talk about controlling behavior, for example, emotional manipulation, and especially sexual violence within couples, for example. They were less recognized and sometimes even rejected. One important thing is that when we look at all the different forms of violence, sexual violence was discussed using this concept, and, and I remember this song that was... Um, quite popular some time ago, these blur lines. And I think they use exactly the same thing. They describe as sexual violence in relationship to consent, as well as a gray zones and blur lines where lack of communication can lead to sexual violence. Um, they also, in, in general, were very open to do something to stop the violence that they were seeing. However, they express that they lack the skills to do so. All right. Uh, and of course, well, more flexible and positive understandings of manhood uh, were emerging among young people. But still, there is a, 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 a remain of traditional harmful understandings um, of, of masculinity that remain in society. And this is just an example from uh, one of the Swedish informants where basically you can read and he's talking about what happens when I'm seeing violence being enacted in a place. So, and he's saying, okay, well, it's not the same if I know the person, if I know the victim, or if I know the attacker. It's easier for me to intervene than if I don't know the other person. What will happen if I don't know the other person? What will I do? How do I approach this? Hmm? It's a more difficult situation for it's a stranger doing it nearby or something like that. And it's a hell of more complicated. So they are demanding from us tools, practical programs to help them develop the skills that they need to have in order to intervene. There were other forms of violence that are becoming more common. Um, cyber harassment and image-based violence, like, you know, sending the nude pictures to someone who is not requesting that, that especially women identify as, as common and very difficult to avoid. 
and to report. Hmm? But they also, they were very clear of what they wanted in terms of actions, in terms of what type of actions they needed and where do they need it. And among the, and among the different actions and settings that they identified, they clearly requested educational programs in school settings that address the issue of not only of consent and violence in themselves, but also of active bystander, how, how to train ourselves to get the skills that we will need to act when we see something. These are some results of the concept mapping study, where through hierarchical cluster analysis uh, from, the, from the, all the countries, we found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clusters of actions that go from policy legislation, organiz organizational actions, media and public efforts, empathy, <laughs> understanding, skills and knowledge, and so on. And you may be wondering what do the stack mean in these figures? So, and this is the how important they were rated. Um, so if you can see the actions that are related to formal and informal education, preventive education and skills and knowledge, they have more stacks in each of the clusters because they were labeled as most important by the informants, both the young people and the stakeholders. But one of the things that we actually look at is we compare, okay, let's see from these actions, let, let's do a cross tab around this and see, okay, what happened when we cross importance with applicability? And we found that in this graph, uh, I don't know if I can, let me see if I can do that. In the upper right quadrant are the actions that are labeled as highly applicable and highly important. So these ones are somehow okay. But when we look at the lower, right quadrant here, these are actions that are very important but less applicable in society as identified by them. And when we look at those actions specifically, we notice that these actions were mainly related to men's individual change. So people perceive that this is so very important but then again it's difficult to achieve this. So, in a nutshell, basically what I have said before, we, we, there, is, there has been positive change. If we compare with previous decades, there is a, a recognition of forms of violence, there is a, a rejection of different forms of violence, and we still need to fight to actually, for people to identify other several forms of violence and to reject them, but what they are asking now is for us to go to the next stage. Now you recognize and now teach me how to deal with them. Teach me how to act. Allow me to gain those skills, how to act. When I see violence being enacted in a public place. Important as well, it's the express need of the young people to actually have these educational interventions in schools in a systematic uh, way, but also with quality that no longer focus only on the sexual part, you know, the anatomy and so on, but give you practical skills on how to deal with sex and sexuality um, in real life. One of the things that we found that in despite of, you know, a significant legal frameworks in the different countries, when, when we go to the actual practice, for example, sexual education in a school literally is actually done. And what is actually done is being uh, conducted by the civil society, by the NGOs. Um, and when we presented, when we presented these initiatives uh, to the local stakeholders in Sweden, for example, there is press a need that this is no longer sustainable. We need to be able to incorporate these educational programs into the educational system curricula so that young people can benefit more about this. 
And finally, just to recognize that young people are resourceful. They, they know what they want. They can identify also different ways of how to solve it. And we need to include them in the planning of policy, in the policy making process, but also in the implementation of those policies as well. A little bit of what we have done so far. We invite you to visit our, our um, project website where you will have our publications. So far, we have our eight papers that we have published in peer review journals. We have, um, help me out here, Nihaya, we have produced a country report, an overall country report for policymakers. Uh, we created educational videos that can be used by anyone if that as cases that you can present to your students and see, okay, what is happening here? Um, what else do we have? We conducted a conference, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead, um, sorry. We developed an educational intervention guide based on the results of the project that is free for anyone to use. Um, we are, we contributed to, to the other tools that are available there. Um, this guide is, is supposed to be used or can be used by someone who doesn't have any training in gender or doesn't have any training in facilitating um, a group work, for example. Why? Because we made it very explicit and step by step so that it can only be, it cannot only be used to discuss these issues with young people, but also to empower the facilitator if the facilitator needs that, how to develop my pedagogical skills, how to develop my knowledge on key concepts of gender and consent and sexual violence and so on. We have our policy brief in general and also for each of the countries. And this is uh, the last day of the presentation, positive mass uh, conference that we had when we had around Let's say a hundred people were joining us from all over the world, where we presented uh, the study findings, but we also had the opportunity to listen to and discuss with experts at uh, Michael Flood, Dr. Michael Flood from Australia, and also Dr. Gary Barker from the United States that joined the conference and contextualized, help us to contextualize the findings. So this is us from Positive Mask. Thank you very much.